to the Street Smart Wisdom Podcast from Wisdom Feed. I'm Steve Stein. In this series, we talk to best-selling authors and thought leaders that are doing great work in the world of mindfulness, psychology, wellness, and creativity. Our mission is to bring ancient and contemporary ideas down to street level. Our goal, to bring you takeaways and insights that you can apply to everyday life. Enjoy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterListen.com. At BetterListen, we have hundreds of audios, courses, and programs available on demand to stream and download. As a listener to the Street Smart Wisdom Podcast, you are eligible for a free audiobook download. Just visit BetterListen.com forward slash free to get your download today. On this show, our guest is the best-selling author and mind-body healing pioneer, Dr. Dean Ornish. In this conversation, we discuss his groundbreaking new book, Undo It. This is part one of the interview. Enjoy. Welcome to the Street Smart Wisdom Podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Dean Ornish, pioneer in all things mind-body medicine. And today we're just going to find out and learn a little bit more about his life's work and, you know, what drives the work and those kinds of things. Welcome, Dr. Ornish. Thank you. It's great to be here. So who are you? You know, how would you define yourself now? Because you've been doing this a long time and you know, a, a mind-body pioneer, or where do you see yourself in the, you know, in the scheme of things? <laughs> I am that. You know, I studied meditation yoga for 40 years with an ecumenical teacher that you know named Swami Satchidananda. And he said, you're fine until you define yourself. And we get stuck in all these definitions. So some of the ways that I define myself, I'm a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm the founder and president of the nonprofit Preventive Medicine Research Institute. And for the last 40, over 40 years, I've directed a series of randomized trials and demonstration projects showing for the first time that simple lifestyle changes can actually reverse the progression of the most common chronic diseases. And we started with coronary heart disease, and then we found these same lifestyle changes that can reverse heart disease, which by the way, include a whole foods plant-based diet that's naturally low in both fat and sugar, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and so on, various meditation and yoga techniques to manage stress and quiet down the mind and body, various just simple aerobic exercise and stretching and strength training, and what we call psychosocial support, which is really love and intimacy, or to reduce it down to its essence, to eat well, move more, stress less, and love more. Boom, that's it. And the more diseases we study and the more underlying mechanisms we look at, the more reasons we have to explain why these simple changes are so powerful and how quickly people can get better in ways that we can measure. And I think our unique contribution has been to use these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be. So we first showed that we could reverse heart disease, and up until then, that was thought impossible. They thought, at best, you could slow down the rate at which you get worse, but you couldn't actually get better, and we found that you could in a series of studies. We then found these same lifestyle changes that could reverse heart disease, could reverse type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, could slow stop or reverse the progression of men with early stage prostate cancer and by extension, breast cancer. We found that we did a publish a study with Craig Venter that when you change your lifestyle, it actually changes your genes, turns on the good genes and turns off the genes that cause you to get sick. Over 500 genes in just three months, that was thought impossible. When I was in medical school, we were taught the only way you can change your genes is to change your parents, which of course you can't do. But it turns out you can turn those genes off and on, which effectively is though you're actually changing them. If you can turn off the bad genes and turn off the good genes, for example, which is what we found. We did a study with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize for her pioneering work with telomeres. And telomeres are the ends of our chromosomes. They're like the plastic tips on the ends of your shoelace to keep your shoelace from unraveling. They actually keep your DNA from unraveling. And as we get older, our telomeres get shorter. And as our telomeres get shorter, our lives get shorter. And the risk of premature death from pretty much everything goes up correspondingly. We found for the first time we could actually lengthen telomeres. And when we 
published that in The Lancet. They called it reversing aging at a cellular level. And we're now in the middle of a new study, the first randomized trial to see if we can actually reverse Alzheimer's. And that has particular interest for me because my mom died of Alzheimer's and she was brilliant. And just seeing her brilliant mind decay was really disheartening. And so, and there are no good drugs for either treating it or for preventing it. So if we can show we can reverse it through lifestyle changes, that'll be a huge breakthrough. And it'll give, you know, many millions of people around the world new hope and new choices that we don't currently have. And so in my new book, which is called Undo It, and I called it for two reasons. One is my favorite key on the computer has always been the undo button. I thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had something like that in our lives? And now we do. But also this ecumenical teacher that I mentioned, the, the Swami, like to make puns. And people say, what are you, a Hindu? He'd say, no, I'm an undo. You know? So it's a homage <laughs> to him as well. And I present this unifying theory, which I co-wrote with my wife and partner of 20 years, uh, Anna Ornish. And I was trained, like all doctors, to view all of these different chronic diseases being fundamentally different from each other, that heart disease is different than diabetes or prostate cancer or Alzheimer's and so on. But the radical theory that we're presenting is that they're really not. They're really the same disease manifesting and masquerading in different forms because they all share the same underlying biological mechanisms, things like chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in things we've talked about like gene expression and telomeres and the microbiome and so on. And each one of these mechanisms in turn is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get and how much love and support we have. And so we kind of radically simplified in that way. So although there's a lot of talk about personalized medicine and so on, and that makes sense if you're trying to come up with this new targeted immunotherapy for melanoma or pancreatic cancer. But for the vast majority of chronic diseases, it's the same lifestyle changes that can reverse all of them. And that makes it really simple for people. Wow, interesting. So while you're focusing, you just mentioned your new book, it's really a common theme that's been going on through your through your life's work. I mean, and I find it fascinating because everyone knows that intuitively, if you're more relaxed, you'll feel better. Yes. If, but now that there's so much research that proves it, that the naysayers, I, I find it once in a while, at a, you know, if we're sitting around having dinner and there's kids, I have two teenagers, you know, I try to make sense and talk about telomerase and that it actually proves that it can help you to live longer or it infers that you can live longer by meditating. And yeah. then the, and the well, science we, that... I mean, we did the first study with Dr. Blackburn showing that we could increase telomerase levels by 30% in just three months by making the same lifestyle changes. Wow, phenomenal. And you mentioned Satchitananda. I'm, since if you're listening on the audio only, it won't mean much to you now, but pointing to that, what's called a yatra? Yantra, uh-huh. Yantra, right. Which, when I recorded you years ago at Omega, I, I did all the recording at the Omega Institute from 85 to 90. And you were there every summer. And we had the tape shop so people could get tapes of all the talks. At about the same time, before I had kids, I was living in the back room. And actually, Sasha Dananda's old room, I rented out. <laughs> and then he had his own little closet or where he meditated, a private meditation room in the back there. And that's where I had all my masters and, you know, all no the... Pun, no, the no, pun no pun intended, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. The master amongst the masters amongst the master. Anyway, so that was always a great uh, connection. But it's also relevant to the conversation is that it's mind-body connection. And the spirit is in there. How do you deal with, you know, the spiritual aspect of this being an MD? I mean, do you kind of strip, try not to say that aspect of it or talk about that? Or, Well, you know, in medicine, we, we tend not to use words like spiritual or love. You know, that's a four-letter word. But I've become much more, I've always talked about it. It's always been an important part of my program. Most people think it's about diet, and certainly diet's important, but you know, we're all going to die. It's just a question of when. So to me, the more important question isn't just how long we live, but how well we live. And one of the things that I learned from the Swami was that there's a causal chain of events that leads to anything. And the farther back in that chain you can go, the more powerful, in this case, the healing can be. And we know that, for example, that stress contributes to so many different diseases. But the stress isn't just simply from what we do. More importantly, is how we react to what we do. 
So you can have two people. In fact, Dr. Blackburn did a wonderful study with Dr. Alyssa Eppel, found that women who were under chronic emotional stress because they were taking care of parents with Alzheimer's, for example, or kids with autism, the more stress they felt and the longer they felt that way, the shorter their telomeres were. And when they compared the low stress and the high stress women, these caregivers, they found that the stressed women had nine to 17 years shorter lifespan than the ones that weren't stressed, which is a huge difference. But even more important and more interesting to me was that it wasn't a, an objective measure of stress. You could have two women in the same circumstance, but one was coping with it better. They were meditating, they were exercising, they were eating well, they had more love and support, and they could buffer or mitigate the effects of that stress. And so even when we can't change our situation, I mean, if you have a parent with Alzheimer's, you've got a parent with Alzheimer's, but you, you, there's a lot we can do to, to change that stress. But if you take it a step even further back, this, the, the, the question is, where does that stress really come from? Where does our health come from? Where does our sense of happiness and peace and well-being come from? And again, because the Swami liked to make puns, he'd say, you know, we're born with a sense of ease and we disturb that and get dis-ease. And that we're, we, you know, our, our peace and our health and our well-being are not things that we get outside of ourselves. And not being mindful of that, we often run after things because, you know, so much of our culture, to the whole advertising industry for one, teaches us that we get our health, we get our well-being, we get our happiness from outside ourselves. And then within it's like, well, okay, if only I had what I don't have, if only I had more money, more power, more beauty, more accomplishment, whatever the however you fill that blank in, if only I had more blank, then I'd be happy, then I wouldn't be stressed, then I wouldn't be sick, then I would love myself. Once you set up that view of the world, he taught me, however, it turns out you generally don't, you feel more stressed, because until you get it, you feel stressed, then the stakes go up. If someone else gets it and you don't, then it's really bad, because then it makes you feel like you live in this very competitive, hostile, doggy dog zero-sum game world, the more you get, the less there is from me, we better really fight about it. If you never get it, it's bad. But even if you get it, it's great for a little while. It's very seductive. It's like, ah, oh, I got it. I'm happy. But it doesn't last. You know, it's usually soon or not so soon, followed by either now what? It's never enough. I remember one patient told me, I can't even enjoy the view from the mountain I've climbed. I'm already looking over the next one. Or if it's not so, now what? It's so what? It's a big deal. Like, it doesn't really provide that lasting happiness that I was looking for. And one person said that, let down that comes from getting what I thought was going to make me happy and found out it didn't really last that long. I make sure I've got 12 projects going at the same time so I can immediately shift my focus to something else. And so what I learned from Swami Satchidananda was that, and perhaps the ultimate irony is that not being mindful that we have that already, that these that we end up running after all these things that we think are going to bring us what we could have already. If we, and in the process of running after these things, we end up disturbing what we could have if we just stop doing that. And that the goal of all these spiritual practices, you know, meditation and yoga and prayer and whatever it happens to be, that the ancient swamis and for that matter, rabbis and priests and monks and nuns and whatever, didn't develop these techniques just to manage stress. I mean, they can do that very powerfully. I mean, that's why elite athletes, you know, always use them in, at a world-class level and in business and sports and in school and whatever. But what they do is they don't bring you a sense of peace or well-being. Rather, they at least temporarily help us quiet down our mind and body so we can stop disturbing what's there already. You know, he used the example of like if you had a tray of water and you're trying to smooth out the tray by running your hand across and you just create more waves. If you just stop doing that, everything settles down. And so at the end of a meditation or however you manage stress, to remind yourself, to remind yourself that these techniques didn't bring you that sense. That's really our natural state. And that may sound like a parsing of words and semantic, you know, Gobbledygook, but it's all the difference in the world because if I have to get my peace and my health from outside myself, then everyone and everything that, that has what I think I need has power over me. If it's me, then that's very empowering, not to blame myself, but to empower myself because then I can do something about that. And then the question becomes not how can I get what's going to make me happy, but how can I stop disturbing what I've already got? And then I can go out in the world and often accomplish even more, but the intention behind it is very different. It's not like I have to do these things to be happy. I've already got that. It's I do these things because they're fun. And, I, and then by serving others, it really frees me from that suffering as well. Wow. So that, it kind of short circuits the, you're the dog chasing his tail. Or, the, or he liked to use the example of like chasing your shadow. And the faster you run after it, the more it eludes you. And if you just stop and walk away, you look behind you and it's following you. You know, I live, well, I can't quite say 
I live in New Jersey, even though I do. I still feel like I live in New York and I'm a New Yorker. And the, it's just so pervasive chasing your shadow. And the, and the closer you get, the faster you have to go and the more elusive it is. Yes. And it's a mindfulness thing. You can miss your life chasing your shadow. And, and then with all the digital introductions to everything now, it's, you know, and being a parent, you have to be a role model. And it, it just, there, there's a, so much happening. And I don't know if it's specific to cities. Are cities quicker, you know, more fast, more fast, more fast paced? Or is it just? I think it's everywhere. And, you know, it's like the cartoon of the, of the donkey with a carrot on the stick just in front of it, you know, or we put people on treadmills to test them. It's a great metaphor as well. But, you know, study after study have shown that people who are lonely and depressed are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely from pretty much all causes Jeez. when compared to those who have a sense of love and connection and community. So I, I used to call it social support. You know, that's an easier, more medical sounding term, but it's really love. And, you know, when we have these support groups, they're not support groups in the sense of exchanging recipes and types of running shoes. It's more creating a safe environment for people to let down their emotional defenses and just connect with people in an authentic and a deep way. You know, 50 or 60 years ago, that's what most people had in this country. They had an extended family they saw regularly. They had a neighborhood with two or three generations that grew up together. And people, they had a church or synagogue or a club that they went to regularly. And when Or a grandparent that lived in the house or around the corner. Two or three generations of people who lived together. And when you grow up in a family like that, they know you. They, they see you. You know, it's not just I see your Facebook profile and all these great things. I know where you messed up. I watched you grow up. I saw where you threw that rock through the window or you were, you know, your demons came out or whatever it happened to be. And you know that they know and they know that you know that they know and they're still there for you. And there's something really primal about being connected, and, you know, authentically, warts and all, as opposed to Facebook where, in fact, one study that I cited in my new book is the more time you spend on Facebook, the more depressed you are because it's not an authentic intimacy. People just post their best life and it looks like everybody has this perfect life but you. It's like, what's wrong with me? How come I'm not, you know, standing in front of the Eiffel Tower or whatever it happens to be? And so in our support groups, when we encourage people to just speak authentically about what's really going on in their life, it's incredibly meaningful. It's like in that scene from James Cameron's film, Avatar, which is really based on an African proverb, I see you, you know, I see all of you. And I think that's the real unmet need. And when, so in our support groups, it's not about just staying on the diet. It's about somebody can say, you know, I may look like the perfect father, but you know, my kid's really messed up. And someone else can say, you know, my kid's messed up too, or I'm messed up or whatever it is. And suddenly it doesn't change the fact they're having the kids having problems, but all the shame and guilt and loneliness and isolation that goes along with that is such a relief. And then it frees up a lot of emotional resources that you can then address these issues in much, in much more constructive ways that don't cause you to get sick in the process. And it also stops... The science behind it, it stops the stress hormones being yeah. fired and triggered. And so you can have a chance to heal. And you know what? Most of the time on Facebook, being vulnerable does not get you more shares. No. You know, being, being your authentic self, maybe, but it's a lot more likely to be more popular if it's in front of a canyon or a waterfall or something. Like there's, that. A, there's a huge market. I've actually talked to the people at Facebook about, you know, creating a an authentic Facebook. I think there's a huge opportunity for someone to do that. But, you know, that's the primal unmet need is that sense of connection and community. And that's why, you know, when, when you feel that, you're much more likely to make and maintain lifestyle choices that are life enhancing than ones that are self-destructive. And so what I learned from the Swami is that meditation will allow you to quiet down your mind to experience that sense of peace and well-being. If you take it even deeper, you can ex listen to your own inner Swami, your inner teacher, your still small voice within, whatever name, the God within, whatever name you give to that. It's that voice that speaks very clearly, but very quietly. It gets drowned out by the chatter of everyday life. It's the one that wakes me up in the morning, middle of the three in the morning and says, hey, Dean, listen up, pay attention. So I've learned that at the end of a meditation, when my mind is more quiet, to listen to that voice and to say, what am I not paying attention to that I need to hear? And all of my best ideas and my most creative things have come from that place. All those studies that I've done really came from that place and then I could reverse engineer to, to see if I could prove that. And the same, if you take it even further, it gives you a transcendent experience that on one level we're separate, you know, you're you and I'm me and we can enjoy having this conversation. 
But on another level, we're part of something larger that connects us all, whatever name you give to that. Even to give it a name is to limit what's essentially a, a limitless experience. And that's why we like to talk about, you know, in a movie projector with, with a light behind the film that the film, you know, has all these great characters and villains and heroes and so on, just so you can enjoy the drama. But you can't really enjoy the drama if you get stuck in it. If you can also have that double vision and see the light behind it that really is behind everything, then you can really play with it and enjoy it and ultimately be that much more successful in doing that. And to me, in my limited understanding, that's where healing is the most profound and the deepest. Because, you know, even the word heal comes from the root to make whole and yoga comes from the Sanskrit, the yoke to unite, union. These are really old ideas that we're rediscovering. And the more diseases we study and the more mechanisms we look at, the more reasons we have to show how our bodies often have this remarkable capacity to begin healing and much more quickly than we had realized when we can work at that level. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And it's, you know, when I recorded you 100 years ago, 30 years ago, it's a long time now, you know, the essence of what you're saying has not changed that much. You know, no. there's, not, there's now science to prove it, which is huge. But anyway, let, let's keep going in this process for this. What, what's different is that we're using these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove the power of these very simple and low-tech and low-cost and often ancient interventions. And the fact that we now have more data, more diseases that we've studied, and now this unifying theory that ties it all together. You know, it's pretty perfect. So the name of this podcast is Street Smart Wisdom. And the idea is to take ancient ideas bring them down, and bring them down to street level. So street level wisdom, which is really what you just described, which is... I mean, I, I'm, I continue to be awestruck by our bodies often have this remarkable capacity to begin healing and much more quickly than I had once realized if we can work at that level. Phenomenal. Okay, so we did the who, we did the what. So why? Why did you become a doctor? Why did you become a holistic doctor or, or what, a researcher? Yeah, it's a long story, which I wrote about in some of my earlier books, but I was suicidally and profoundly depressed when I was in college and came very close to killing myself, about as close as you can without actually doing it. And I would have done so had I not gotten so run down that I got such a, so sick with infectious mononucleosis that I literally couldn't get out of bed. My parents saw what a wreck I was. I went home to Dallas. I was at Rice University in Houston, which, although it wasn't in the course catalog, actually had the highest suicide rate per capita of any school in the country then. And my plan was to get strong enough to kill myself, as weird as that sounds, <laughs> back in 1972. And my older sister, I was a, just begun my second year of college, my older sister was a child of the 60s, and the Swami had really helped her out. So my parents decided to have a cocktail party for the Swami when he was visiting, lecturing in Dallas. This was back in January of 1972. That was pretty weird back then. I mean, even today in Dallas, that would be weird, but especially then. And so there's an old saying that when the student is ready, the teacher appears, and that was certainly true for me. So in walks in our front door, this central castings looking guy, like a Swami supposed to look with long white beard and saffron robes and the whole bit. And he gave a satsang, a lecture in our living room, and he started off by saying, nothing can bring you lasting happiness, which is why I was about to kill myself. I'd already figured that out. It's like, well, then why, why, why not just do yourself in? And also, plus, I felt like I was really stupid and somehow just managed to fool people into thinking otherwise. And the combination of feeling like I was stupid and never going to amount to anything, and even if I did, it wouldn't matter because nothing could bring lasting happiness. I thought, well, well, dead people look like they're happy, and at least they're peaceful, so why don't I just kill myself? And I was all set to do that, but I, the, the, you know, and everybody would say, oh, no, things will make you happy. Just you know, get rich and famous and all those things, and then you'll be happy. And I knew that wasn't true, because, and I've since have worked with a lot of rich and famous people who are profoundly unhappy, or if they're happy, it's despite that, not because of it. And then now the Swami's going, nothing can bring you lasting happiness. And I felt incredibly validated, like finally somebody understands that. But then like he's happy and glowing and I'm ready to, to kill myself. Like, what am I missing here? And he went on to say what really turned my life around and may sound like a new age cliche, but it was incredibly profound to me, which is what we've been talking about, that nothing can bring you lasting happiness. But he's, that's the bad news. But the good news is that you have it already until you disturb it, which we've been talking about all along here. And so I thought, okay, well, let me, I'll move killing myself down to plan B. Let me try this weird stuff. And, you know, having grown up in Texas eating chilies and cheeseburgers and meat five times a day, it was a really radical change to, he said, to be vegetarian and, you know, get some exercise and meditate and 
and you know, spend more time with friends and family and people who love you. Basically, the, the beginnings of the program that became my life's work. And so then I said, okay, well, let me try that weird stuff. And I began to get glimpses of what it felt like to be peaceful. They weren't very long, but they turned my life around because I literally began to say, oh, that is true. Then I could just need to spend more time in that peaceful place. And then I went back to school and graduated first in my class and gave a baccalaureate. And I say that not to brag, but it's just to say, on the one hand, I, I felt like I was totally stupid. I couldn't even read a headline on a newspaper and tell you five minutes later what it said. And then by changing my own inner life, I was able to function at an extremely high level, get into medical school and so on. And then in medical school, I was learning how to do bypass surgery with Dr. Michael DeBakey, who was one of the pioneers who invented the operation. And we cut people open, we bypassed her clogged arteries, he'd tell them they were cured. And more often than not, the patient would go home and do all the things that had caused the problem in the first place. They'd eat junk food and not manage stress and not exercise and so on. Their new bypasses would clog up, we'd cut them open again, bypass the bypass, sometimes multiple times, and so for me, bypass surgery became a metaphor of an incomplete approach that we're literally bypassing the problem rather than treating the cause. And this problem was treating the cause. So I wondered what would happen if we treated the cause. And one of the nice things about going to medical school in Texas is that it's like, oh, you got this weird idea, go for it. You know, it won't work, but you'll learn something. So the chief of medicine donated the tests and the chief of cardiology referred patients. And I went to every hotel in Houston and the Plaza Hotel, which isn't even there now, donated 10 of its rooms to us for a month. And put 10 men and women who had really bad heart disease and they got better. And they not only felt better, but they were better in ways we can measure. And that kind of set me off on my life's journey to be doing this work. Amazing. Phenomenal. So, and by the way, it also taught me that when you're in, when you're in pain, when you're suffering, there's an opportunity for transformation that goes beyond just, you know, making the pain go away. And this, and that's, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, when you're in a challenging situation, that's the challenge is to find the lesson or to find the peace, you know, in the challenging situation somehow. Yeah, now, as a doctor, I wasn't trained to see that as an opportunity. I was trained to kill the pain, bypass it, numb it, whatever. And so we have a sacred privilege as, as doctors to be able to work with people when they're suffering because there's an openness to change. It's like, you know, change is hard, but if you're hurting enough, suddenly the idea of change becomes more appealing. And one of the reasons I spent over 40 years doing research is that it shows people that and raises awareness that if you're willing to make these changes, your pain is likely to get better or go away and you can begin to heal. And suddenly all this weird stuff like diet and exercise and meditation, it's like, well, that's kind of weird, but okay, let me go for it. And then now Medicare and other insurance companies are covering my program at hospitals and clinics. You Phenomenal. Go to Phenomenal. Order. If you go to our website at ornish.com, it's they're all listed there. Most insurance companies are paying for it. So we're really creating this new paradigm that for me is really a conspiracy of love because it's not just about unclogging and opening arteries. It's about opening hearts in ways that, you know, bring more love and compassion into this world. And, you know, in the same diet and lifestyle changes that are good for you are good for the planet. You know, more global warming is caused by livestock consumption than all forms of transportation combined. And it takes 10 to 14 times more resources to make a pound of meat-based protein as it does plant-based protein. So we can feed the hungry. We can, you know, reduce global warming. You know, your brain gets more blood. You can think more clearly. Your face gets more blood. You look younger. Your heart gets more blood. Your sexual organs get more blood. You know, so you have hotter sex and a cooler planet. So from whatever perspective you look at this, these simple changes can be transformative and what's personally sustainable is globally sustainable. And what's good for you is good for the planet as well. Ph phenomenal, phenomenal. Just to backtrack a, a little bit, while you were, was it 1972, you were having your, yes. your crisis? Uh -huh. So how I got into all this stuff was in 1972, my mom died of cancer. Hmm. And that was when chemotherapy just started. And she smoked cigarettes. There are pictures, Super 8 pictures of her feeding me a bottle in one hand and smoking a cigarette in the other hand. Wow. And anyway, I had an aunt who also had cancer and she lived in Connecticut, happened to be next to Bernie Siegel. And she started working with Bernie and she lived to a ripe old age. And so one of the first things I did out of college was, as I was recording events, was, uh, you know, I came across, you know, the surgeon Bernie Siegel, and that's what kind of put me on this path all, all these years, you know, okay. collating, creating, you know, life-affirming things and ideas that you know, kind of try to, you know, be a, a distribution channel for that. All right, so as we come to the 
close of this section. It's not a trick question, but let's give it a shot anyway. If you were a superhero, what would your origin story be? I was born on Krypton before the planet exploded. No, no, that's a different lifetime. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> was there a catalyst? I guess you were just talking about We've already it. talked about that, I think. Right, right, right. Okay, Krypton. Okay, sounds good. No, not, not that, I mean, before, you know, but... No, I'm just joking. Right, okay. right. That life and death situation and a teacher walked in the door. Yeah, that um, was my superpower. I like it. I like it. Okay, so... We'll wrap up this section for now. So thanks so much for being here. And remind us how people can find you listening to this podcast. Well, my new book is called Undo It, which my wife uh, co-wrote with me. We've been together now for 20 years working together. And our website is ornish.com. Everything on there is free, lots of information. And having seen what a powerful difference these simple lifestyle changes can make, I really appreciate the chance to share them with you because to me awareness is always the first step in healing so thank you for giving me this opportunity to be of service in such a meaningful way welcome great to have you as our guest we'll see you next time bye now you've been listening to street smart wisdom the podcast from wisdom feed You can follow Wisdom Feed on Facebook, Twitter, and iTunes. If you haven't, please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast on iTunes. We appreciate your feedback. Join us next week for another Street Smart Conversation. Thank you for listening.